And joining me now is NASA astronaut Dr. Jessica Meir. She was one of two women to participate in the first all-female spacewalk in 2019. It was during these seven hours outside the International Space Station that Dr. Meir also became the 15th woman ever to walk in space. Dr. Meir, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chuck. It's wonderful to be talking with you today. What is your biggest concern? I know you're very excited about all this private sector aspect of the space race, and you're benefiting from it. You may go up in some private flights, et cetera. What is the biggest concern, though, when the private sector subsumes the public sector? Well, you're right. There are a lot of competing financial priorities, of course, and those are things that our federal government has to take into account when they are, you know, figuring out all of the budgets, including that of NASA. But I don't think that we are going to necessarily be overcome by all of these private companies. I think the key thing for us at NASA is that we see us working together as a complementary relationship. And I think that's really necessary given where we are, especially with those competing financial priorities like you talked about. You know, back in the Apollo days, 4% of our budget 4% of GDP was spent on the Apollo missions. Now the entire NASA budget's only about 0.04%. That's not just human spaceflight, that's all of NASA. So we need this. We need these partnerships with private companies. We need these international partnerships like we've been doing on the International Space Station. That to me is just realistically the way that we will continue to explore and continue to further our presence as humans in space. We don't have any nationalized airlines. Do you expect actually NASA to go away over time? Well, I hope not, because I want to keep getting my paycheck, <laughs> but we'll have to see what happens. You know, as I was saying, I, I don't think it will go away. I think that we will continue to operate in this type of partnership. I think we still need these larger government-backed organizations for some of the more risky long-term prospects. So, for example, right now, by leveraging these partnerships with commercial partners like SpaceX and Boeing to concentrate on what we call near-Earth orbit, low-Earth orbit for the International Space Station, we can use are more limited NASA assets to go toward the next destination. So that's what we've been doing. SpaceX and Boeing have been building these spacecraft to keep getting astronauts to the space station. NASA has been focusing on building the Orion capsule to go even further, the next step beyond that. So I think you'll continue to see, I hope that we'll continue to see a partnership really where we can work together to offset some of those costs and then still fulfill all of these objectives. You know, one of the ways that I think we all decided the Cold War was over is when astronauts and cosmonauts, when, you, when, when the Russians and the Americans started sharing some of this technology, giving each other rides, uh, uh, sharing this stuff. It certainly, though, looks like now we're back into a competition with China. Um, describe the relationship we have in space with China. How competitive versus how cooperative? You know, that's a really good question. I think it also draws back to that Apollo time frame. I think you and I both know that the only reason we went to the moon when we did was because we had that space race, that Cold War. We had that political motivation, which then spurred on getting the right amount of resources behind it. So I've actually been kind of hoping that what you call that kind of competition or watching what China has been doing in space in the last many years would maybe help us with that, would give us that driver again, make it more, more than just a space exploration, give us that, that driver to push even further. And I haven't really seen that happen, at least not directly so far. So we're continuing to watch. You know, I can say I'm con definitely supportive of everything that China is doing. They are definitely pulling off some impressive feats with their space station, with their astronauts, and also with their rovers going to Mars, for example. So there's a lot going on right now. And I hope that perhaps either the competition propels both of us to mm -hmm. keep succeeding and to get there. And then in the future, you know, right now, we at NASA are not collaborating with the Chinese. We still are collaborating with the Russians, with the Europeans, the Japanese, and the Canadians. Um, but we don't have that partnership with the Chinese right now. So whether it's through competition that drives us and propels both of us further, or eventually in the future, if there is some kind of collaboration, I think both of those things would be very positive, would be assets to the exploration of all of these bodies. Why is there not a base on the moon yet? Is that because of technology, or was it because we decided to, you know, the Cold War ended, and then maybe had the Cold War continued, we would have based the moon, but because the Cold War ended, we didn't want to spend our money that way? 
Yeah, that's right. I think it's definitely the latter, in my opinion. You know, I, we have the technology, we have the know-how. If we could do it back then, then we can certainly do it today. It's not easy to go to the moon. We know that. I think that's why we're not there. If it were still easy, we would have still been able to maintain that presence. But we do have a very strong program to go back to the moon right now, the Artemis program. And this new administration is definitely supporting that. We will be sending the first woman and the first person of color to the surface of the moon hopefully in the next few years. So I'm really happy to see that kind of emphasis put on it again. All right. You have some amazing perspective on the pandemic. And the, what I would <laughs> say is amazing is that you left uh, for your tour in space uh, in 2019 and you came back and parachuted into a pandemic. Um, just describe what that, I mean, I can't think of anything more surreal, but you tell it in your words. Yeah, absolutely, Chuck. That was one of the really most memorable parts of my mission. Like you said, we, we launched in September of 2019. Nobody had heard of COVID-19. While I was on the space station, we watched the pandemic emerge and unfold across the entire planet. And a lot of that felt a little bit surreal from us. You know, we are still getting some information up there. We're, of course, not bombarded by it, like on your cell phones here on Earth. But we're getting the news. We're talking to people back home. But to be so distant from it, you know, part of us, we kind of felt like we were on a movie scene. You know, they panned at the space station, and then the, and there are a few people up there, and the entire planet gets wiped out by a meteor or something. And it was, you know, we joked about that, but the gravity of what was happening was was really profound for us. And then to come back in April, which was really, you know, things were quite bad here in the U.S. and all over the world, that was quite a time to return. Our colleague, Chris Cassidy, came up to the space station just about a week and a half before we left, and he told us, he said, look, I know you guys know what's happening, but you really need to prepare yourself mentally because you're absolutely going back to a completely different planet. And that was so true. Well, the whole reason you're doing this is for the potential backup plan for Earth as it is. I guess we got a, a little bit of a, uh, a preview of what that feeling may be like. Absolutely. Uh, Jessica Meir, um, it was a pleasure to talk with you. Really appreciate you coming on. Uh, meet the Press Reports. All right. Thank you very much, Chuck. Take care. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.